Welcome to Calculus and Vectors exam review unit three. We called unit three max and min. We did a few different kinds of things and we're gonna see, I think a, a small example of each of them uh, right here. We started talking about just maximum and minimum values and sort of recognizing that when the slope of the tangent is zero is where you either have a local max or a local min or maybe something else happening. You could have a horizontal tangent line, something like that. So there are different things that could happen, but that could be where a max or a min takes place. So we explored that just a little bit to start, uh, looking at max and min on an interval. That was something that we did. Then we did some uh, applications using this idea. Then we did curve sketching for quite a while. So we're going to see a little bit of all of that. I'm going to start, obviously, with an application. And to do that, I'm going to go right back to our lesson on this and again you can review this on your own but if you remember we had these strategies I wouldn't I mean I've got these labeled as steps but it's not like step one two three four five six seven these are just things to consider while you are uh, working on this so diagrams can be very helpful um, in order to figure out what variables should represent and, and make sense of the problem uh, we often name what's being maximized or minimized. Again, that helps us think about what we're actually writing a, an equation about or an expression for. Um, you might have other variables you have to define. We write out our formula for what is to be maximized. Uh, and then, generally speaking, I don't know if you remember this, but if you've done this question and you didn't take the derivative somewhere, you probably haven't done the question properly. Okay, so write out the formula, take the derivative find the turning points by setting the derivative to zero and solving and then we usually verify that it's a max or min by doing a check right around there um, to make sure it's actually either look either a max or a min or whatever it is that it's supposed to be okay so keep that in mind those are some of the things that we're going to do while doing this now this is one of the types of questions that we covered we covered a few different types rectangular storage box with an open top is to have a volume of 10 meters cubed so when we're reading this we want to be mindful of any givens so it's giving us the volume okay we don't know what we're being asked for yet unless we remember this question but we're being given the volume the length of its base is twice the width so that's obviously going to come into play Material for the base costs $10 per square meter. Material for the sides costs $6 per square meter. Find the dimensions that will minimize cost. So that's what we are to be minimizing. Cost is to be minimized. So we have to come up with an expression for cost. And the cost of the material to build the box is kind of like surface area of the box. Okay. Uh, found all answers. I'm sure that's supposed to say round all answers to the nearest tenth. Uh, so find the dimensions and state the minimum cost is what we're asked to do. Now let's do a quick little diagram of this. So uh, first I'm going to draw the bottom of the box. Then what I recognize is if I fold everything out, I would get a flap coming out this way, a flap coming out this way, a flap coming out this way, and a flap coming out this way. Imagine a cardboard box that you've unfolded. There's no top, so this is what we have. So I've got W here and L here. And it tells us that the length is twice the width. So L equals 2W. Okay. It also gives us the volume that's going to be important, I think, for later. Sometimes we start with an expression for surface area. And I'm going to do that here to make sure that we understand everything that we're doing. Uh, but you could go right to an expression for cost. In the end, you need to have an expression for cost. Okay, you might write down other givens. So volume equals 10 meters cubed. You may do that or you may just remember that you're given it. It's not a bad idea to write it down. It forces you to think about it. Um, we, we'll come back to the cost of the materials for after. So I'm going to start with surface area. But be careful if you start with surface area that you don't get um, 
stuck with surface area because that's not we're not minimizing or maximizing surface area we are minimizing cost okay there's one more dimension that we need here and it's this one which would be the height of the box so i'm going to add that in okay and you can think of it, this however you want but i'm gonna i'm gonna just look at these different flaps and i'm gonna recognize that this one the area of it will be the width times the height and i'll have two of them so my surface area is two times width times height and this one is height times length and I've got two of those because I got this one and this one so plus two times length times height plus and this part is the width times the length now I can sub in for L equals 2w because we don't want multiple uh, um, variables here so 2wh plus 2 2wh plus w times 2w which is 2wh plus 4wh plus 2w squared now take a look at what happened here I have got two WHs. These are the sides. This was the smaller side, and this was the longer side. And the sides cost a different amount from the base. So that's what's important. So I can simplify this, six WH plus two W squared. But we're not done yet, because now we want to say, so cost equals so the, the sides, which is now this simplified version, it was started off as these were the sides, but I was able to simplify down to 6WH is $6 per. So $6 times the sides plus $10 for the base which is 36WH plus 10, sorry, 20W squared. Now, we still got that H in here. We don't want that H. Uh, it's gonna get in the way big time. So how do we get rid of it? Well, that's why we're given the volume. So if you recall, there's another little side piece that we always, whoops, that we always do. So we do volume equals length times width times height. Okay. But we know the volume, it's 10. And we know the length is 2W, so I might as well sub that in. So this is 2w squared, so 10 over 2w squared is height, so the height is 5 over w squared. And now I can sub that in over here. And this w will divide with one of those, okay? And 36 times 5 gives me 180, whoops, plus 20, thought something was missing there. So this works out to, so now this is an expression just in terms of W because I've subbed in, so C at W. And this works out to 180 over W plus 20 W squared. Now I can take the derivative of this. C prime at W will be negative 180 over W squared plus 40 W. Now we are setting this equal to zero and determining the values for W where it's equal to zero. And so you, you could simplify fully here, but actually I think maybe there's an easier way. So if I set this equal to zero, uh, because that's where critical values, I should say, critical values occur when C prime is equal to zero or does not exist. C prime 
does not exist when w equals 0. Why? Because we'd be dividing by 0. Okay? But this is not going to be the maximum value. Okay? So uh, this is inadmissible, not really in our domain of what's an appropriate um, answer, right? So inadmissible. So now where C prime equals zero, and this is where it just pays to have that experience and know what your best options are. It's going to be a lot less work not bothering to simplify this to one fraction, just moving the 180 over w squared equals 40w. I'm going to divide by 40 over here, and I'm going to multiply by w squared over there. And 180 over 40 is 9 over 2. Then we take the cube root. And we'll work out what that is approximately. And it's approximately 1.65. And that way we have something to check. Although the cube root of 9 over 2 isn't too bad to type in. But we need to check something just, just to the left and just to the right of this um, to do our check and see, make sure that this is actually a minimum because we are minimizing cost. Okay? So, so far, we started thinking about an expression for surface area, but then we realized that this was the side, so the sides were $6 and the, the base was 10 and what we actually wanted was an expression for cost, and we needed to get that in one variable. So we were able to sub for L, because we, we could sub in 2W for L, and then we had to come up with this expression to sub in for H, because we were given the volume. Okay, so I'll come over here and do my check. So C at let's do 1.6 c at uh, the cube root of 9 over 2 and c at 1.7 and I get 163.70 I get 163 54 and I get 163.68 so that is the minimum so it looks like we're on the right track okay and um, so if the width is approximately 1.65 then the length is twice the width which is approximately 3.30 and the height is 5 over the width squared. These were all the expressions that we came up with before, which is about 1.83. Therefore, the dimensions to minimize cost are 1.65 and we are dealing in meters here so meters by 3.30 meters by 1.83 meters and the cost is $163.54 cents. So that was one of the types of applications that we did, and it nicely shows all the different parts and all the different thinking we had 
uh, some definitions of variables just in our diagram, drawing a diagram, thinking about it, using our diagram to start coming up with our equation, but turning it into equation for cost and then doing the whole ordeal with setting it equal to zero and solving. This question is a max min on an interval. This is what we kind of started this unit with because we were just thinking about what was happening with a max or a min. Okay. Um, so where do maximums and minimums occur? They occur when the derivative does not exist or when it's equal to zero. Now, the other thing that we want to think of is we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, where the bottom is zero. And we, we hadn't talked probably a ton about this because we did this before we did curve sketching, but now we know that this is true. And so if I get a derivative does not exist at zero, I can disregard that because it's an asymptote. Now it would be strange to do maximum and minimum values on an interval that contains an asymptote because you wouldn't have a max or a min value. Um, you might have a min and not a max or a max and not a min, or you might not have either depending on the behavior around the asymptote, but it would be strange. So generally speaking, we don't, we don't ask questions where there's an asymptote in an interval and you can tell this excludes so uh, that uh, that asymptote so this is not in the domain so we don't have to worry about it but that is something you should always be thinking about so first of all let's take the derivative of this thing again this is quotient rule so it's the derivative of whoops equals the derivative of the top, which is 2x, times the bottom, which is x, minus the derivative of the bottom, which is 1, times the top, which is x squared plus 4 over the bottom squared. Simplify 2x squared minus x squared minus 4 over x squared which equals x squared minus 4 over x squared. Critical values occur when x equals 0, uh, sorry, not when x equals 0, when f prime at x equals 0 or does not exist. f prime does not exist at x equals 0, we were expecting that, not in domain. Okay, so we only have to worry about where it's equal to 0. So 0 equals x squared minus 4 over x squared. Now this is, uh, just as a reminder, it's where the top is 0, so I don't have to worry about the bottom. We already know it's an asymptote, but, but still, um, when you're just solving a rational equation like this, you only have to worry about where the top is 0. That's why we do the whole simplification. So x squared is 2, and x is... Be careful, sorry, it's four, I'm getting ahead of myself, is plus or minus two. So we've got those two points. And if you remember, so we've got these two places where there could be a max or a min uh, in the interval, could be a maximum value, a minimum value, a horizontal tangent line, lots of stuff could be happening here. Uh, but the other thing that we have to remember just in this kind of a question is we have to check the ends of the interval. Just quickly, a graph could go like this and have a maximum value here and a minimum value here. It could go like this. So it's got a it's got a local max here and a local min here that would have that you would get the derivative equal to zero, but the actual minimum is there and the actual maximum is there. So we have to take those values into account in order to see where the overall max and overall min of the uh, function r in this interval. One last thing to think of though, this one's not in the interval, is it? This one's not in the domain that we're working in. So we actually only have three values that we have to worry about. So we're going to check x equal to 1, the beginning of the domain, 2, the value that we found, 
and 10 the end of the domain or the interval. And these are usually just quick checks where we just state what the values are. 5, 4, and 10.4. Therefore, um, the minimum minimum is 4 when x equals 2 and the max is 10.4 when x equals 10. Sometimes you're supposed to state what the actual minimum or maximum value is. I would do that every time. Even if the question says just where is the minimum, we usually like to state what the minimum actually is. Okay, so there's max and min on an interval. That was the beginning of that unit, exploring local max and min values. And here we go, here's the big one, a full curve sketch with all of the stuff that we can do, all the concavity and points of inflection, classified critical points, um, asymptotes and end behaviors around the asymptotes and intercepts. Now, very nicely, the this is already done for us. Okay, so we don't have to do the actual derivative, saves us a lot of time, saves us some space. What we might do before we go ahead and do anything else is some factoring. I can factor on top here, so this becomes x squared uh, times x squared minus 3. And that one I don't think I need to factor at all. And I could factor the bottoms here too, but I've already done it once, so I'm going to leave those ones for now and just recognize that it's a difference of squares because that will be important sort of later just for the technicality of how we show our thinking. Okay, and generally speaking, we started with intercepts, so that's what we're going to do. We've got to find x-intercepts and y-intercepts. The y-intercept is just when you sub 0 in for x. So when I put 0 in for x, I get negative 1 on the bottom, but 0 on top. So my y-intercept is just 0. And my x-intercept is going to be when y equals 0. And when y equals 0 is when the top is 0 and the top is just 0 at 0. Okay, so I've got one intercept at zero of each kind, obviously, one y-intercept, and at zero, zero. Okay, now we'll go to asymptotes. We usually start with our vertical asymptote, and we've got two of them, when x equals negative one, and when x equals positive one. Okay, so I'll start with negative one, so the limit, as x approaches negative 1 from the left of, uh, not f at x, because it's not f at x, it's y. And the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of y. And let's take a look at these. So if I am just less than negative 1, uh, then this will be negative, whoops. And this will certainly be negative, so I've got two negatives here which is positive, but this on top will still be negative, so this goes to negative infinity. Okay, I'll do that one more time. So this is like um, a value of negative 1.01 .01 or something like that. It's just to the left here. So when I put it in here, the negative value is bigger than positive one, so this remains negative, and this is obviously negative. So those are together make a positive, but a negative cubed is a negative. Okay. Now when I put in something like negative 0 0.99, this one becomes positive. So I've got a positive, and I've got a negative, and I've got a negative. So two negatives makes a positive, so this one's going to positive infinity. Okay. 
and then for the limit as whoops x approaches positive 1 from the left and the limit as x approaches positive 1 from the right so once again I'm doing the same kind of thing I'm putting in 0.99 just to the left of 1 so this will be negative sorry positive but this one will be negative but now the top will be positive because it's already positive so cubing it will obviously stay positive so I've got two positives and a negative so this one's negative infinity and when this is positive 1.01 .01, all of those parts are positive so this becomes positive infinity okay so I've got my end behaviors for my vertical asymptotes now we're gonna do some work for the oblique asymptote and to do the oblique asymptote remember we actually do this division and we can't do synthetic because even though this has two terms it's not a linear uh, expression it's not a linear factor it is quadratic so we're going to need a ghost term anyway so we are going to have to use long division minus one And this one's always kind of crazy. This is x cubed plus 0x squared plus 0x plus 0. So how many times does x squared go into x? In other words, what do we multiply x squared by to get x cubed? And we multiply by x. And then we take x times x squared gives me x cubed x times 0x gives me 0x squared and x times negative 1 gives me negative x that 0 that 0 0x minus negative x is x bring this down now I actually have a 0x squared term here so this is how many times does x squared go into 0x squared? So that's 0. So it's a little bit strange, but this is what I got as my result here. And so then I get um, 0 times x squared is 0x squared plus 0x plus 0. So 0, x minus 0 is x, 0 minus 0 is plus 0. So I got a bit of a strange answer here. But if you remember, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. If you want to see the whole thing, then you're going to have to go back to uh, the original lesson to really see this. But therefore, y equals, okay, the quotient that we get here, which is just x, plus the remainder which is this, the remainder part is this over the, sorry, this is over this, the original thing that we were dividing by. Okay, so the oblique asymptote is y equals x. That's a pretty easy one. It's got a slope of one and uh, y intercept and an x-intercept of 0. Usually that's what we're worried about is the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts of the oblique asymptote. And then my remainder part is x over x squared minus 1. Okay, and so this is what we can use to do our um, testing around the asymptotes. So r at negative 100, again, I'm doing a similar kind of thing. Uh, I get negative 100 squared, which is positive, but I get negative 100 on top. So that whole thing is less than zero. So I will be below the oblique asymptote. And that's positive and positive. So this is above zero. Therefore, we are above the oblique asymptote.
So I think that is all of the intercepts and asymptotes, vertical asymptotes and oblique asymptotes. Remember that you either have oblique asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes. You do not have both. It's one or the other. Um, and uh, I think that's everything for that. So now we have to go to our critical values and our possible uh, points of inflection. So we go critical values occur when y prime is zero or does not exist. Sometimes we say y prime exists everywhere, but it doesn't, right? Y prime will not exist when x is plus or minus one, when the bottom, when the denominator here is, is zero, which is at plus or minus one if I factor this. Uh, positive one squared minus one is zero, negative one all squared minus one is zero. So y prime does not exist. I always do this first. Uh, x equals plus minus one, but both of those are vertical asymptotes. So we don't have to worry about them. So then I say y prime equals zero uh, when the first derivative is equal to zero. So that's this thing, x squared times x squared minus three, use the factored form. So that's when x squared equals zero or when x squared minus three equals zero. So that's when x is zero and that's when x squared is three or x is plus minus square root of three. And square root of three is approximately, it's good to have this actual value, 1.73. Okay. Now we can do um, our possible points of inflection. And that's when the second derivative equals zero or does not exist. And then again, going up here, finding our second derivative, it will have the same does not exist at plus or minus one. We just have to state it. You can't ignore it. You have to state it, but then you can be done. And then we'll have where it's equal to zero. Plus minus one, but those are both vertical asymptotes. So we don't have to worry about those. So y double prime is zero when I get two x times x squared plus three equals zero. And that's again where x equals zero or where x equals plus or minus root three. So there's a lot happening at both of those places. Um, Actually, hold on, that's my mistake. Plus or minus negative three. This is x squared plus three. I didn't notice that this was x squared minus three. That's different, so this is no good, okay? We're only worried about real values, so we don't have to worry about that. So we only have one. Okay, so that's better. That'll make it a little bit easier. All right, now we gotta do our chart. Do I have room here to do the chart? I think I maybe I do. So we're gonna start with x. And then we're gonna have y double prime and then y. And for x, we go to, we have to include our asymptotes as well because concavity can change around asymptotes. So starting from the very left, our, our leftmost value is negative one. That is an asymptote. So less than negative one, then negative one, then between negative one and zero. And then zero. And then between zero and one, and then one, and then greater than one. Now, we didn't have to, we don't include the critical values. We just put, slot those into the intervals later on. And I'm gonna rewrite for reference what y double prime is. It's 2x times x squared plus 3, that's important, over x squared minus 1 all cubed. So you, at this point, you, you might be able to do some testing uh, in your head, but you probably want to uh, program this into your calculator and just start punching values in and doing it quickly. So using my calculator to test... 
this one's factored nicely, so you might be able to just figure it out, but this one works out to negative. Here is a vertical asymptote, so it does not exist. Here it is positive. Here it's equal to zero. So it's possibly a point of inflection. We don't know yet until we do the next one, but it is negative, so that will be a point of inflection. And this is negative. This it does not exist because it's another vertical asymptote. And here it's positive. Okay, so this changed concavity, so it's a it's a point of inflection. Uh, this is concave down. This is concave up. Concave down. Concave up. Okay. Now here's where we take our uh, values of plus or minus root 3, which is plus or minus 1.73. So negative 1.73 is here. So we have a local... Uh, it's concave down, which means it looks like this. So that's a local max. Of negative square root of 3. And then punching this into our calculator to get the y value of negative 2.6. We have a POI at 0, 0. We already know that because we've done a lot of work with that one already. And then this one is concave up. So it's got a local min. And it's at positive root 3, positive 2.6. Again, punching that into our calculator in the original function y to get the y value. Okay, and I like to label these a, b, c, to fit onto our graph. And our graph is now what we are going to do. So let's get our shape here. I think that's good enough. And I would like it to be black. And, well, I'm going to put the intercept on there. There's a lot happening at this point. Okay. And I'm going to put my asymptotes in. That plus or minus one. So we'll call this negative one. Try to go about the other, about the same on the other side. Call this positive one. We put those in and we label them. Make sure you label those. Um, and our oblique asymptote. So our oblique asymptote, so I need that ruler back, goes through the origin like this and it goes at about, I mean, it would, I guess it'd be like a 45 degree angle because it's y equals x, but you don't have to be perfectly on scale. But in this case, we actually can be. Sometimes you don't want to because you won't be able to draw the second part of your graph. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, and now we're going to pencil in our behaviors. So I'm going to come up here and find my behaviors. As I approach one from the left, I'm going down. One from the right, I'm going up. So one from the left, I'm going down. One from the, le from, from the right, I'm going up. That was negative one, positive one. From the left, I'm going down again. And from the right, I'm going up. I'm going to erase these after, so I'm going to kind of make them big so that I can make sure to erase them. So I see right here that I'm coming down. This is an intercept. It's also a POI. It's also a critical value. Where is it? That means it's a horizontal tangent line. So a POI doesn't have to be a tangent line. I'm just going to show you what I mean. This is concave up and this is concave down. And somewhere in here there was a POI, but there was no horizontal tangent line. But a tangent, horizontal tangent line will come in and go tangent before it goes down. So that's what we need to draw. Okay, And I know that it does that because it goes through that point and it does all those things and it starts up here and ends up down. That wasn't great, but... 
Oops. I'm going to try that one more time anyway. So I want to come down and I want to come in kind of sideways and go out kind of sideways. Whoa. My computer is not cooperating right now. There we go. That's much better. Okay. Something like that. And then it approach oh, the oblique asymptotes. When it goes off to the right, it's above. And when it goes off to the left, it's below. So there's no funny business in this one. When it goes off to the right, it's above. When it goes off to the left, it's below. So this goes like this. Oh, jeez. Out of practice. And this one goes like this. There we go. And don't forget, I've got a local min there and a local max there. And those are A, B, and C. And that, I believe, is the completed graph. I've got my asymptotes labeled. I've done my curve. I've labeled my points. I've drawn my points. I only had three in this case. Often you have more. Uh, there was a lot happening at B. It was an x-intercept. It was a y-intercept. It's a horizontal tangent line because it was a critical value, but it was not a local max or a local min. It might have been, but it wasn't, right? We got that one. We got two others, and those actually were local max and local min, and everything in the graph fit together. That's always so important that everything uh, fits and matches and if you ever get that strange feeling like something's not really matching up here what's going on it probably means you've got an asymptote out of place or your oblique asymptote is not crossing your your vertical asymptotes in the right spot something along those lines can really mess things up or you've got an asymptote on the wrong side of an intercept that'll make a big difference okay those are some of the little things um, that's a big one but all the steps that are involved a lot of setting things equal to zero and solving for intercepts and for critical values and possible points of inflection, and as well a little bit of a refresher about how to test behavior around asymptotes and to find the asymptotes. And that is it for unit three, max and min. Um, although a lot of this stuff we end up doing in some of the other units as well, so we may see some more of it. Otherwise, that's it for unit three.